and part of the, tr the storage mechanism that determines what gets priority storage is emotion. Okay, and remember, emotion is physical. Emotion is not a mental thing. Just, maybe you don't know that, so I said remember, but let me just be clear. Emotion is chemical, physical. It is not mental. Interpretation of emotion is mental. Visualization, observation of emotion is mental. But the experience of emotion is not mental. It is chemical, physical. It's biology. But here's the thing. Something happens to you, and it has an emotional tag. And I want to say the things that, that are stored with priority storage, that emotional tag is always negative. It is part of the negative file, negative polarity. So you have something happen to you, or you imagine something happens to you, and you have a strong emotion attached to it that is mostly negative. And then and you're in such a life situation where you cannot deal with it at that time. So mostly we begin this pattern of storage of negative information and quanta when we're children. And the reason why is because we're ignorant and we're stupid and we're children. We don't understand what things mean. We don't understand the context of life. We don't understand adult motivation or behavior. We don't understand alcoholism. We don't understand drug abuse. We don't understand dysfunctional family dynamics. We don't understand PTSD, that our father was a war veteran and was traumatized in the war or was in a prison camp or was in some horrible circumstance of life and that as a child and as a teenager and then as an adult they were kind of dis functional, occasionally very erratic emotionally and mentally. Maybe they were a little mental disturbance. Maybe they were violent. We don't understand any of this because we're children. We have no way to understand the context of why the world is messed up around us. All we know is at any moment we're subject to die. Children think they're going to die all the time. It doesn't take much. Any little thing, and the kid thinks, Psh, I'm out of here. We learn not to trust. We learn not to believe. We learn that our thoughts are not considered substantial. We learn to not express our own feelings in the way that we feel them when we feel them. That's called socialization. And first socialization starts within the family context. In other words, every family has an emotionally acceptable, emotional expression pattern dynamic. Wow. Let me say it another way. In my house, the only person who was allowed to express rage was my father. It's a rule. That's a rule. In my house, the only person, as a child, the only person who could break things because they were mad in the house was my father. If I lost my temper and broke something in the house as a child, I was punished. Severely. But if my dad broke something in the house, that was called deal with it. Like it or leave it was a phrase that was used sometimes. Long as I feed you, shut the, you know, in other words, that's the way. So there was, a, there was a rule book of emotional expression of what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. The problem is, is that the emotions that we felt as children had nothing to do with the rule book because they were spontaneous and natural. And if things weren't right, we noticed. Okay? Every family has that. 
And some of it is functional. In other words, some of why our families teach us a uh, certain curtailing of emotional expression and suck it up if there's pain and stuff like this it literally is functional in the sense of it, in certain situations it's important to learn how to not express your pain in order for you to live longer. You don't want to show signs of weakness in certain situations. Not because it's not appropriate, it's appropriate emotionally, it's not appropriate situationally because if you show certain signs of emotional weakness in front of some people, they will hurt you more because you become a uh, food item. It's part of victim profile. Victims look like victims. It's a problem. Part of the reason why predators choose their, their predation strategies, we've studied this, and this is very well studied, is that a lot of predators choose their victims based on that the, how much they look like a victim. And they avoid the ones who don't. This is literally as serious as that. If you're in a family that's grown up in a traumatic environment, you are taught this at a very, very young age. And so you internalize your, your discomfort, you internalize your pain, and you don't speak out, especially if you're in a household that has violence. You learn very, very young not to question authority or speak out or speak contrary to the authority that, that you live with. Why? Because you don't, you, eventually you just don't want to get hurt anymore or you want to reduce the pain. And then you, you sublimate this. There's a point in time where you no longer consciously know that that's what you're doing. It is part of who you are. But all of those stories and all of those impacts and all of those events are still there. They're all still there, stored in the subconscious mind. See, it doesn't make sense until you understand, stored in the tissue. Now, the reason why we store them is functional. Right? Uh, I'm out camping and I notice that a mama grizzly bear has decided to come and eat me. You know, I see the bear, I hear the bear, the bear is growly, bear doesn't look happy. I've seen a happy bear, yogi bear, and I've seen an unhappy bear, grizzly bear, mama's about to eat somebody, they don't look the same. I can tell the difference. Bears run really fast, and the bear starts to come after me. So what I don't do, I, I know I am now instantly afraid or fear for my life, and righteously so. So what I don't do is try to work through my issue of being afraid of bears <laughs> while the mama grizzly bear is about to attack me. That's not what I do. What do I do? I run away. Right? Maybe I yell while I'm running away, unless somebody told me that don't yell because bears will chase you more if you yell while you run away. And so I'll try not to yell while I run away. Okay? But I'm going to run away. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Oh my. In fact, now let's say right up to the moment the mama grizzly bear came after me, I had a life. I had a family. I had a job. I was uh, looking at a promotion in my business. I just had a windfall. I won the lottery the day before. Had a windfall, a cash. And, and right up to that moment when the bear attacked me, I was thinking about the new stuff I was going to buy with my lottery money. Life was good. And then just like that, life is not. And in that moment, I have no other life, no other ideas of life, no other issues of life, no relationship issues. That divorce just is not bothering me right now because the bear is after me. And so I drop my whole life internally and my whole life emotionally instantly. Even if I'm injured physically, even if I have cancer, guess what? The next moment, I don't have cancer. All I have is whatever it takes to beat feet. Right foot in front of left, 
as rapidly as possible, zigzag if I can, <laughs> get something between me and the bear, that's it. And all of my faculties of life, every breath in my body, every atom of my existence becomes about getting away and not dying in that moment. That is normal. That is appropriate. But now, I survive, I don't die. I am now what we call traumatized by the bear attack. I now have PTSD about bear attacks. Okay? That's fine. I'd rather have PTSD about a bear attack than I was eaten by the bear and have no PTSD. See, I don't have PTSD because the bear caught me and ate me. Right? So I'd rather have the PTSD. Why? Because I can deal with that what? Later. You see? I can deal with the bear tried to eat me later. But in the moment, I can't deal with it. Now imagine a child dealing with every emotional negative thing that happens or can happen potentially to a child as the bear. And the child has no judgment system that tells them what's going to take them away and what's not. Mama says she's going to kill him. Child believes mama. Father says they're going to kill him. Child believes father. Because in that moment, father's the bear. You're ne you know, if you don't eat your peas, you're never going to eat again. On some level, the child thinks that it's possible they may now have to starve to death because they said they didn't like peas on some level. And that is not resolvable. The child cannot resolve this. So what happens to these unresolvable traumas that we have is stored in the tissue. And if there's a physical intervention that happens at the same time as the emotional trauma, like the bear almost got you, got a paw on you, and actually got a piece of you, that body part, where the bear almost got a piece of you, where the bear scratched you, now becomes the focus for the emotion. And over time, that body part, if this is not resolved, may get sick. The Thai say, and tr really, uh, again, this is more on the magical side of the Thai medicine, that when we're exposed to trauma that relates to a body part, that First of all, here's the presupposition. All of our parts have consciousness. Just like I said, the organs have minds. Well, the ties say, so does your elbow. So does your knee. Your knee has consciousness that's unique to your knee and unrelated to your head. And your knee doesn't know that your head is in charge. And it's called Quan. So, and there's Quan specific to every region of the body, and we actually divide these regions up and give them names, and they're called Marma. So Marma is both a point, and Marma is a region of specific intelligence of an entity which we call Quan, which is the mind of the body part. So if I traumatize a body part, and there's an emotional context to that trauma, the Quan leaves the body part. And it may move to a different part of the body, or it may leave the body altogether. And part of the idea of therapy is to reconcile the spirit of the parts, to bring the Quan home. Mat Ban Quan, to bring the spirit home. Okay? So the body is a touch screen, energetically. It's covered with points that relate to all the functions and all the organs and all the meridians and all the sen lines and all the chakras and so on. Because these points are actually how we gather information from the environment, from the universe, at d uh, different frequencies. And then it also relates to the inner life of the organs, especially. All the points on the body are not equal. And there's a lot of points on the body. You see this chart behind me? That's a typical acupuncture chart. It actually only lists 360 points. That's all that's listed on this chart. In, a, in the Nanjing, 700, over 700 points are listed. 
and the classical acupuncture theory over 10,000 points. But here's the funny thing about it is, if I draw an outline of you on the board, and I just start putting dots where the acupuncture points are, do you know that if I put a dot where every point was eventually, what I would have drawn is a portrait of you? Pixelated. In other words, point by point. If I, if I take it, the outline of you and I just start with the big ones, the chakras, boom, 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 boom. And then I get the marmas and the joints, <coughs> boom, 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 boom. And then I get the uh, uh, points on all the meridians, you know, the 11 points on the lung meridian, boom, 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 boom. And all the points on the bladder meridian, boom, 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 boom. And then I do the, ten, the ashi points, the extraordinary points, boom, 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 boom. And then I do the jing points, boom, 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 boom. And I do the biao points, boom, 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 boom. And I do the leo points, boom, 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 boom. And eventually, I have now drawn a portrait of you. Recognizable as you. There's that many points. Because every cell in the body has to have ac access to the life force. That, and how does it do that? Through its own little meridian. So there's billions of cells. Technically, there's billions of meridians. And there's billions of points where these meridians communicate to each other. In fact, every cell is a point. And they're all working together in real time interdependently, synergistically, and sympathetically. And that is, be, we can do that because we have the holographic crystal and matrix that the computer scientists are postulating will be possible for them to access in the future. We're already there. That's how we can store all this and still be functional. But here's the thing. Those old trauma is stored in the tissue and depending on the severity of the trauma and or every other similar thing like it that's ever happened to you in your whole life, which has now also been stored in a similar fashion in a similar place, it causes distortion in the tissue. It causes distortion in the innervation of the tissue. It causes distortion in the circulation of the tissue. It causes echoes of distortion in your mind in the way you think, in the form of tapes that you mistake for current thought. You ever have a thought that you're slow or stupid? One time. Okay? That's not you. It's not your thought. It has nothing to do with what's happening now. All you have to do is go back to when was the first time that you thought you were stupid? Or someone told you? You were stupid. How old were you? Where were you? Now, as an adult, you can do that. And you can think about, what was the circumstance? Why would this adult have told me when I was five years old that I was stupid? Why? What possible motivation would this adult have had to have had to grab me up by the arm or to grab me by the shoulders and shake me and tell me how stupid I am? Don't look at you in that situation. Look at them. And all of a sudden, you'll get information. They were drunk. They were inebriated. They were stressed. They were traumatized. They were in a, a bad situation. They were actually speaking words to you that they were thinking about themselves but because you're a child, you don't know that that's a thing. You don't know that sometimes adults say things to children which have nothing to do with the children, that it's actually an expression of a thought that they're thinking about themselves, that they're saying out loud to the child because they know the child is not going to smack them in the head for saying it. But the child doesn't know that those words are not actually about them and have nothing to do with them. The child doesn't know that. The child thinks, well, they must be stupid. Because why else would someone say that? Mom, uncle, auntie, dad, cousin. Why would they say that if it wasn't true? 
And so we store it. We can't reconcile it. We can't argue it. We can't ask them, what do you mean? Well, I'm not stupid. You know, I can't argue with them. You can't convince them by weight of your reasoning that that is bullshit and that it doesn't make any sense and it's inappropriate to say to me as a five-year-old. It's really inappropriate for you to have this conversation with me as a five-year-old. You are expressing your own inner self dissatisfaction and you are using me as a sounding board and as a template for expression of your own unhappiness. Try saying that to an adult as a five-year-old. Doesn't fly. Right? Not going to happen. So what do we do? We store it. And those words echo. It's just like, how many people have watched like Star Trek movies and things like that? You ever get this theme where they say, that sometimes the reason why the aliens come is because they received a 70s sitcom radio broadcast or television show out in Andromeda and that made them curious to come find us because broadcast radio goes out into the ether and then keeps on going infinitely. Like if you take a flashlight and you shine it up in the sky that light is traveling at 186,000 miles per second, the second it leaves the flashlight. And even if you turn the flashlight off, the light that was released from the flashlight is a thing that continues in space forever at 186,000 miles per second. Hypothetically, a million years from now, someone could get a spark in their eye because of your flashlight. It's physics. So just because something was said to you 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, doesn't mean it's gone. And where did it go? Chances are if there was an emotional correlation or consequence or event when that communication was made, or that event happened, or that accident happened, uh, it's still stored in your tissue. And we call those old, unresolved, negative emotional issues. And the way that we access them is by bringing energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure to specific points on the body, but also we're unlocking a combination lock in order to gain access to the energy that's stored in the tissue, we have one of our, you know, it's like one of these locks that has three tabs, okay? So one of the tabs is mental. One of the tabs is physical. And one of the tabs is emotional. And so we have to know the combination. And we spin and we set the, emo the mental, we set the emotional, we set the physical, and then we push the button to open, and bang, we get access to the old unresolved negative emotional issue in real time as it's stored in the tissue. And by doing so, by opening the case that was locked, we release the charge. And we now have an opportunity to resolve it. This is Something that has been taught in Buddhism, I know I'm using a lot of Buddhism, okay, but is this idea of how do you handle bad karma which exists in the past? There's this, conce there's this concept which is every thought, action, and deed exists forever as a causative factor. Uh, a term that's used sometimes is called a point of independent origination. A point of independent origination. And so it could be infinitely in the past. And we, uh, most people, when they think of past karma, they think of past lives. Okay? But I want to tell you something. Whether you believe in past lives or not is irrelevant. What you can believe in, I believe I can convince you of this, is that your life as a child is a past life. It was you, but not you. Not the current you. It was you, but not you. But still in you. 
And your life is a four-year-old. Your life is a past life. Your life as a five-year-old is a past life. Your life as a seven-year-old is a past life. Your life as a 10-year-old is a past life. You are a completely different person than you are right now when you were 10 years old. Completely different. You thought different. You reacted different. You had different conversations in your head. And yet that 10-year-old is still completely within you. And formative. And there are tapes that you developed when you were 10 years old. Guess what? In the right circumstance with the right trigger. Sometimes we call these triggers landmines. Because the way they play the tape is so sudden, sharp, and abrupt, and unpredictable. Someone just looks at you a certain way. Someone just has a tone of voice. So a certain situation occurs. And boom! This tape plays. And you feel the emotion. You feel the fear. You feel the despair. You feel the, 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 fill in the blank. Part of the way you know it's a tape is, this, is the, the sudden onset. And it's repetitive. You've heard this before. This fear, it's not new. This conversation, this self-depreciating conversation about yourself, fill in the blanks, it's, it's not new. It has nothing to do with where you're at now. At all. But it feels so present and it feels so real that we, again, and we don't know because we haven't practiced the discipline of trying to sort through what are real thoughts and what are not real thoughts in our head. It's hard to tell the difference. So you've learned to identify the players. And one of the ways that we do this is with tapping. Every point that we tap is an acupuncture point. But it's not just any acupuncture point. I've listed the points in the book for you. These are what we call crossover points or bridge points. The reason they're significant is because although there's a point on the surface of the body, okay, deep within, it crosses over all the other meridians at that point. So, it is uh, the main entry and off-ramps on the expressway of energy in the body, if you will. And they're specifically collected as a series of points because of how they relate to organs and tissue and how they relate to emotions. That's why. Okay? And so to do the affirmation, there are, very di there are many different strategies with how we do the affirmations. Uh, I, I have a stupid, dumb, and ugly right now, so I'm going to tap on it. Even though I have the stupid, dumb, and uglies right now, I deeply and completely accept myself. Even though I have the stupid, dumb, and uglies right now, I deeply and completely forgive myself. Even though I have the stupid, dumb, and uglies right now, I deeply and completely accept myself. Okay? And so what I'm doing is, that's mental. Right? The recitation of that mantra, because at that point, the recitation of the negativity is a mantra. And what I'm doing is, I'm affirming it. Now, a lot of people who've read too much Louise Hay and this idea of positive affirmations and positive statements, like they, you think if you, if you say something, that if you acknowledge something that's negative in your life, that that will add to it or make it manifest, is perfectly ridiculous. And the reason why is because there's nothing in you but negative stuff most of the time. Okay? And so just having a positive affirmation once in a while is not going to change that. Because you have all this old, unresolved garbage that's ruling your thoughts, ruling your emotional life. So what we want to do, for lack of a better way or phrase to say it, is... Um, call a spade a spade. That when I say, when I see I have fear in my mind, and I go, even though I have fear in my mind, I'm not making a negative statement. I am actually speaking the truth. I have fear in my mind. See, we need to speak more truth. This is a teaching. And the tapping actually gives me an avenue, gives me a way to speak more truth in my life about What's going on inside of me? See, I don't pretend it's not there. You cannot, here's a principle for you, you cannot resolve what you believe is not real. You cannot resolve 
what you believe is not going to affect you. You cannot resolve what you won't admit is in front of you. Now I'm going to give you one final lesson about this, a little story kind of thing, and then we'll move on. Okay? Uh, one of the most famous books in uh, Buddhist medicine is called the Bardo Thodo, or the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is the common name. But actually, Bardo Thodo doesn't mean that. Bardo Thodo, translated literally by Robert Thurman into English, means Book of Betweens. Okay? But, eh, you know, you, you won't find the Book of Betweens. You've got to Google Tibetan Book of the Dead. Okay? In the Bardo Thodo, it is instructions for the newly deceased. It's a guidebook on how to be a dead person appropriately, how to be a dead person appropriately, and how to go through the various stages and events of transformation that dead people commonly go through. That sounds pretty handy, doesn't it? I love it. I love these kind of practical medicine kind of things. And the reason why it's practical is because a lot of people will look at the Tibetan Book of the Dead and they'll hear that description about how to be a dead person and how to go through the transitions between one life and the next and so on. And they think it has to do with some idea of mythology of past lives. And they don't understand that one of the secret teachings of the Bardo Thodol is it's not about past lives, it's about this life. And how many times do you die in this life to yourself? How many times do you transform into a new life situation that is completely different, and yet you are still the same person, and you bring all your baggage with you? And baggage being old, unresolved, negative, emotional issues. And along the way, as you go through these various transformations and stages of life, you have guides and teachers who come, avatars and guides and teachers who come to you at each place. In other words, there's no place in the bardo where there's not help. How about that? I love that. True concept. No place in life, no desperate situation, not even in the realm of hell beings, where there is not an avatar who specializes in helping people in the realm of hell beings. But even in the better realms, there's help. And sometimes they're called Buddhas, and sometimes they're called guides, and sometimes they're called Harukas or others. Okay? They have different names. Icons, symbology, different names. Okay? But the most powerful transmission, transition in the Bardo comes when you leave the limitations of the completely sensual material realms and you have the first access to realms that are not entirely physical. And there's a gatekeeper. Now, at first, the gatekeeper is not obvious. You find yourself in this between place. It's like an open plane it's described as. And you hear a roaring noise and a sound like rushing wind and water all at the same time with loud crunching and crackling that sounds like broken glass or broken sticks or broken bones. Uh, you hear growling and grumbling and rumbling and a sound like a roaring, rushing train coming right at you and you see a cloud of debris and lightning and thunder and disturbance like a tornado coming at you across the plain. And so what you do is you do what anybody would do. You run away and you hide. But very, very quickly, you begin to understand that this roaring mess that's coming at you across the plains as it gets closer, and it does get closer, no matter, you're already trying to get away, but it's getting closer, and you start to see arms and legs sticking out of the cloud in the whirlwind, and you start to see that it is a great demon with eight arms and four faces and many legs, and as it's running at you, corpses and skeletons are manifesting under its feet, which is crunching into dust as it runs at you, and that's part of the sound that you hear. And it's screaming at you with all four heads, and its girlfriend is hanging off of its body, 
She's hanging on for dear life. I know. Vajra Haruka is his name. Vajra Haruka is running at you and comes at you, and no matter what you do to try to get away, you run, you zig, you zag, you, you, you get under something, you what, and no matter what you do, it catches you. You can't get away. And so finally, there you are, and there's this demon in front of you, this horrific, scary thing. And every arm of this demon is something sharp, and something pointed, and something hooked, and something hammerly, something that could hurt you, something that could bind you, something that could cut you. Except in two of the hands, one hand has a pile of white stones, and one hand has a pile of black stones. And Vajra Haruka comes up and has cornered you, where you've tried to get away unsuccessfully, and stops right there in front of you, and you're scared to death, and it starts throwing stones on the ground. A million stones. Because there's one stone for every thought you've ever had in your life. There's one thought for every action you've ever done in your life. There's one thought for every deed that's ever occurred to you in your life. So that's a lot of stones. And gradually these two piles grow up in front of Vajra Haruka. One's white stones, one's black stones. The white stones are the good ones, and the black stones are the bad ones. Every harmful thought, action, deed, every time you curse somebody who didn't deserve it, every, and, and also every time it's happened to you. Okay? Because remember, most of your thoughts are not your own. Most of your thoughts are actually reflections of tapes from past events, and most of them have been given to you. They're not yours, but they count anyway. Why? Because they generate action. They generate deed, whether they're yours or not. You allow them to take you where you don't need to be. If the black pile is bigger than the white pile, Vajra Haruka immediately grabs you up and then tears you apart, limb from limb, and then strips the skin off your body, and then strips the muscles off your bones, and then strips the tendons off of your bones, strips your organs apart from every other organ, and then takes the knives and strips the bones bare till they're shiny, bones and piles them all up in front of them and then jumps on them and stomps everything into dust. And when the last atom has been destroyed, snaps its finger and you are back in the plane. And the play starts again. And you're being chased again by everything that is most of what makes you afraid in life by everything, all at once, and nowhere to hide. And it knows where you live. It knows your strategy. It knows if you're going to zig left, it goes left. It knows if you're going to zig right, it goes right. It knows that you're going to try and crawl under something. It looks under the something for you and finds you again and does exactly the same thing. And this goes on over and over and over and over and over again, endlessly. And there's no time limit. And you feel everything. Every time you are destroyed, you feel it. You feel every cut. You feel the 10,000 cuts. You feel everything, everything. And then you remember the words of your teacher. And your teacher told you, should you find yourself in a situation like this, the strategy is not to run away, because you can't. The strategy is not to hide from that which makes you afraid, because you can't. It knows where you live. The strategy is not to pretend like it's not there, because it doesn't care <laughs> if you pretend or not, because it's really there. The only strategy that works with Vajra Haruka is you stand up, you take a breath, you look it right in one of the faces, because it's got four faces, you look at the face that's facing you, and you say clearly, that which is before me is nothing but 
a reflection of my own perfect luminosity. In other words, that which is before me is me. And I take full and complete responsibility for every negative thing before me. I take full and complete responsibility for every violence. I take full and complete responsibility for every unkind thought, action, word, deed, ever. I take full and complete responsibility. That which is before me is a reflection of my perfect luminosity. And in that moment, when you make that declaration, guess what happens? Basra Haruka goes and dissipates like smoke. And in the next moment, coming out of the smoke in the story, okay, is the blue crystal medicine Buddha. Himself, in the flesh, the blue crystal medicine Buddha manifest. The blue crystal medicine Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, birth from the third eye of Kuan Yin, manifest in front of you. And in your own words, in your own language, see, it's a really cool thing in the Bardo, the Buddha speaks whatever you speak. So if you speak cracker, the Buddha apparently speaks cracker. Whatever you speak and ask you, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? That you have a choice. You can go with the Buddha to the blue crystal medicine land at that time, or you can choose another incarnation for the salvation of all the unresolved, unsolved souls in which case you become bodhisattva. And this is the birth of bodhisattva. Those who decide that, you know what, I could go to the Blue Crystal Medicine Buddha land. I could be free of all this. I could be free of the wheel of incarnation and reincarnation. I could be free of the, of the rule of metta and karma and so on. I could be free, but there are those who are not free and I realize ultimately no one's free till everyone's free. And as of this moment, I will devote my life force, my consciousness, my being, every thought, action, and deed for the betterment of all living beings. And then I will find the creative way that I will do that. And so then you, are, you pick the realm that you want to manifest in. And some choose lesser realms, and some choose the realm of hell beings, and some choose whatever, and then you come back and you are now an avatar and a bodhisattva in that realm, teaching and helping, guiding, protecting. But you know, it's not about past and future lives. We live in the realm of hell beings right now. This is the world of samsara. We live in the world of pain and suffering, as defined in the Bardo Thodol. Like you read the different realms, guess what? We're in the realm of hell beings. If you know, it's like, oh, check the box. Oh, yeah, okay, murder, mayhem, da -da -da, check the box. Disease, famine, war, oh, check the box. Uh, environmental degradation, devastation, uh, annihilation of entire species, oh, check the box. If you go through all the boxes, we're in the realm of the hell beings. And guess what? The fact that we're even here having this conversation means that we have a capacity to deal with it. We just need to know how. That's what medicine is. It's the how. Tapping is a way to start to clear the debris that keeps you from being able to see your true mind. And if you could really see, if you could really know, if you could really be clear about what you really think about everything in your life at any given time, guess what? You would make better choices. You would make better decisions. You would instantly become more powerful in your life. And if you're more powerful in your life, well, guess what? You're a, pond, you're a stone in the pond. You're instantly, by ripple effect, powerful for those around you. See, that's how it works. And if our ripples cross, that creates harmonics. Throw two stones in the pond, 
you get two circles of ripples. When those ripples bang into each other, they create a third set that continues infinitely. So we're actually working on an infinite scale. Even though it's personal, I'm working on my negative issue that I have right now. I'm working on my pain that I feel right now. I'm working on my fear that I have right now. But yet, at the same time, I'm working on something bigger, something larger than myself. We've known about tapping for a long time. Somebody hold up the tapping book. Somebody hold it up. See that picture? See that picture? I took that picture, the tapping book, right here. Look at it. That's not it. I took that picture at Wat Ampawa in Korat, Thailand. That is a wood carving in a temple. That wood carving is over 400 years old. And that is a picture of the monks at Wat Ampawa tapping and doing a tapping treatment. That's what that is. The abbot of the temple took me into the bot and showed me a series of friezes that are all wood covering, wood carvings. By the way, this little temple, the walls are covered with carvings like this from floor to ceiling on all the walls and polished mahogany floors that are so shiny you can see your face in them. It's a gem. It's like being inside of a jewelry box. That temple like being inside of a jewelry box. But what is so special about that jewelry box? It is meant to preserve the medicine. And the monks at Wat Ampawa still practice this medicine today. So if you go to Ampawa district and you go to the floating market and you go to Wat Korat and then you drive for another half hour from Wat Korat to Wat Ampawa, then you can go to this little temple and you can get treatments from the monks and you can actually see the monks. And if you are a monk, if you want to stay in the temple and learn some of what they're doing, they will be very happy to teach you for free. Because they don't do medicine for money there. And by the way, that won't work here. And the reason why is because the community supports that temple for the last 500 years. If the monks at that temple need something, guess what? They get it. There's always food. If they need construction supplies to rebuild something that's breaking down, it just shows up. If they need help repairing the tiles on the roof of the temple, people just show up. Start repairing roof tiles. And they've done that for 500 years. That, if you did that here, you would starve. Okay? But that's what I'm saying. This tapping is not new. Okay? You hearing about it, you learning about it, that's new. You learning a short form to do it with 20 points, not the original form I learned where you needed to know 700 points. You only need to know 20. Okay? Bless you for having a shortcut I didn't have. Okay? What took me years to learn, you can learn in this class and be functional just in one class. All right? All right, well, that's it. I'm going to not talk about the tapping anymore for now. We will continue the discussion. We'll talk about it more as we go from here, okay? If you have any questions about this or anything that I've talked about today, please make a note, and the next time we get together, I'm going to ask, do you have any questions now yourself? about this process or how it works or how it works for you or what, you know, whatever. But we're going to go through a whole class on the tapping, right? And um, so anyway, thank you so much for letting me talk to you about this this morning. Cup to my cup.